my pleasure to welcome you here this morning. My name is Tim Griffin. For those of you that are joining us for the first time, maybe. Um, and of course, as always, we are going to be led in worship this morning by the wonderful Reverend Lisa Stedman. <laughs> Today is a communion Sunday, so make sure that uh, you have something to drink. Um, iced coffee and a donut is fine. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Make sure you have something if you'd like to participate. As always in the United Church of Christ, all are welcome at Christ's table. This morning, a couple of quick announcements, and I'm going to pass it to Andy for an announcement, and then Lisa for an announcement, and it's a communion Sunday, so I'm going to go quick. Um, Charlotte has the August mission. So August is upon us. It's August 2nd. And from Charlotte, last year, our church supported Church World Services by providing 15 buckets of supplies for emergency response. This year, obviously, many things have changed in how we do church, but the need for those buckets remains, and we'll again be hoping to provide 15 buckets of supplies to Church World Services, but we're going to do it a little differently this year. The mission team will do the shopping, fill the buckets, and deliver them to Bow, New Hampshire, to get on the truck for delivery to the areas in need. What we're asking for this year is cash donations to make sure that we can buy the supplies at a fraction of the cost that you probably could buy them yourselves to fill those buckets. It also ensures that the supplies are the right supplies. So the are very compact, and if they want a four-inch sponge, they want a four-inch sponge. And if we buy six-inch sponges, they don't necessarily fit, as we found last year trying to do oh, the shopping boy. individually. So, a bucket is about $75. So, if you can donate $15, that'd be about a fifth the cost. 25 would be a third the cost, and obviously $75 buys an entire bucket. You can make your donations online or by check. For online, go to the website and click Donate Online. Enter the donation in the, in the Missions CWS bucket, bucket line under bucket. Gift Donations. So you'll see that. It'll be obvious once you get to the website. If paying by check, as always, make them payable to Deerfield Community Church with the CWS bucket noted in the memo line and mail them to our PO Box 420 by August 30th. We'll make another announcement as weeks keep coming to make sure we're on top of this, but we'd love to see an initial big donation push this week. So, um, the other thing I have is mark your calendars. This is big news. I know that the moderator <laughs> sent a note yesterday, um, but VZ Park, August 16th. So August 16th, 9 a.m., VZ Park is where we're going to worship together, in person, socially distanced, wearing masks. Um, but please make sure you've noted that. There will be no online service on that day for those of you that are out of state or out of the area. Um, we will do our best to make a recording of that day and get it up on YouTube later in the day. And I'm saying we will do our best because we've never done it before. So if it doesn't work, we'll send out a note saying it didn't work. If it does work, we'll send out a note saying here's the link. We'll post something. Yeah. So, Lisa. Turn on your turn on your mic and then say it. It's on. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's off. <laughs> oh, you didn't. There you go. It now used to on. be that Tim turned my mic on for me every day. But I don't touch it anymore. But now he doesn't touch it, <laughs> and so it doesn't matter whether I slide the mute button back or forth. If the if the microphone isn't on, it won't connect. Correct. So, um, I have an additional announcement about next Sunday. Next Sunday, as many of you know, we're excited to go up the mountain to Horton Center and join much of the rest of the New Hampshire Conference of the United Church of Christ on the mountain at Horton Center for worship. But we will start here. Well, not here, but there where you are, we'll start together with a greeting and a sharing time at 9 a.m. As usual, I'll be um, broadcasting from home. Um, 
and to welcome you and greet you and remind you that we're going to the mountain. After we've gotten a chance to say hello to each other and everything, then uh, probably at about 9.15, we'll log off and um, then you're invited to climb the mountain and uh, tune in to their pre-taped -broad pre broadcasting uh, at any time later in the day. So, greeting and sharing here at 9, as usual, on our usual link, and then off to the mountain we'll go. And the last announcement we have is from Andy. Hi there. Oops, my mask fell. Um, those of you have received, some of you have received emails from me regarding the virtual choir. Tuesday night at 7 o'clock, if you wish, we'll have a Zoom meeting, and I will model a whole process right from beginning to end. It, it's not as complicated as it, it might sound. And anyone else who would like to come along, my email, do you have that? She's going to put it on. Yep, it's there. What? It's in the chat. Oh, it's, it's in, in the, the chat. chat. Very good. So chat it up. But anyway, so it's going to be Tuesday at 7 o'clock. And I'm going to model the whole process. Tim and I have talked about ways of possibly making it even easier for you. So there it is. So if you have any interest in it, or are definitely interested in it, or think you might maybe someday be interested in it, check it out, OK? Have a wonderful day. It's a beautiful day, so I'll get off so you guys can get out and play. Thank you, Andy. We look forward to singing together again. <clears throat> So with that, let's be, in, uh, let's be in the presence of God. Let's be mindful of the air moving around you, the Holy Spirit, and welcome the light of Christ here in the sanctuary and in your spaces at home. As we gather in the light of Christ, we also gather in Christ's spirit, and we sing a song of blessing. The song that we're going to sing this morning is a well-known spiritual entitled, Give Me Jesus. We have it in recorded form, and the words, which are very simple, will appear on the screen. Please sing along as the spirit moves you this morning. In the morning when I rise In the morning when I rise In the morning
join in prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for this day and for your presence with us wherever we are. We thank you, O oh God, for the ways your spirit dances and swirls around us in the wind, in the breezes, and in the air. We pray, O oh God, that we would be swept up in your spirit, that we might feel your love this morning, that it might move us and inform us that our lives may be changed and that we may see the world and be in the world in new ways, in Jesus' ways. All this we pray in his name, and we pray together the words which he taught us, saying, <coughs> Our Father, who art Lord, in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debtors, as we forgive those who have debts against us. I don't know. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, you never know how the Lord's Prayer is going to go. <laughs> I was thinking it's been over a year and you're still struggling with that. Huh? I still don't know what the Lord's Prayer is. It was different in my last church. Yes. So we go over to our friend, Evelyn Dakota, who is our lay reader for this morning, our scripture reader for this morning. Good morning. Our first reading from scripture this morning comes in the form of a responsive reading based on the 91st Psalm. This is one of those Psalms that reminds the hearer of God's faithfulness through the ages. It invokes the power of God and celebrates God's protection and care for his people. The promises of salvation for those who trust in God are so strong in this reading that one can imagine it has inspired belief in the hearts and minds of many who have heard it. May it also inspire us today. Please join me as we share a reading of Psalm 91. You who live in the shelter of the Most High, who abide in the shadow of the Almighty, say to God, my refuge, my refuge and my fortress, and my, fortress. And my, fortress. my God oh, my. in whom I trust. Remember the promises spoken to you by God. <clears throat> I will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. I, I will cover you, you with my pinions, and, and under, under my, my wings you will, will find refuge. refuge. My, My faithfulness, faithfulness will shield you. You have no need to fear the terror of the night or the arrow that flies by day. Or the plague that lurks in the shadows or the scourge that stalks at noon. Though a thousand fall at your left side and 10,000 at your right, it will never come near you. You will see it pass you by. Because, because we, we have, have made God our refuge and have and chosen God, God as our dwelling place, place. God, God has, promised. has promised. No evil shall befall you. No disaster will come near your tent. For God, For God will command the angels to guard us, us in all our ways. On their hands, they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot <clears throat> against a stone. Oh, oh let us give thanks for the covenant, for the covenant of God, God. whose declaration endures. Because you love me, I will deliver you. I will protect you because you acknowledge my name. 
When you when call you upon, upon me, me, I will answer, answer you. you. I will be with you in trouble. I will deliver you and honor you. I will, I will, I will satisfy, satisfy you long life, life and show you my salvation. salvation. <clears throat> Thank you, Evelyn. Welcome. Can't tell which is on and which is off anymore. That's on, it right? Yes. It, I guess. Okay. I talked to, well, texted with Jennifer yesterday and asked her, please, if I could take over her spot um, in sharing in the circle because I had something that I wanted to share. And I'm wondering, I know we have some young in body as well as young in heart. I see Merrick, Merrick, not her mother, Emily, but Merrick. And Pender, I'm trying so hard to learn Merrick's name. And hopefully, they're they the Griffin girls. Um, so we have at least four uh, children in body with us, or youth in body with us, as well as the rest of us who are young at heart, right, and in spirit. Today, I want to tell a story about a woman who lived over 250 years ago. Now, over 250 years puts us in what time range? Who's a historian? Long time ago. 1700s. Like the 1700s. 1700s. Thank you. Thank you. Well, this story returns us to a theme I introduced two weeks ago as a way of helping us look at current events in our country, we're looking through the eyes of faith. And I'm teaching and preaching about the messages of faith we find in the lives and poems of African American poets. The first poet today is this woman who I want to tell you about. She lived in Boston before the Revolutionary War. She was the third American woman ever to be published and the first African American ever to be published. Her name was Phyllis Wheatley. Oh, yeah. I heard somebody say, oh, yeah. yeah. Well, at least that's the name we know her by. We don't really know her original name, the one she was given at birth. You know your names, the ones you were given at birth, most of you, but we don't know Phyllis Wheatley's. That's because she was born in Senegal or Gambia in West Africa and sold into slavery. She was brought to Boston when she was about seven years old. She was brought over on a ship that was called the Phyllis and she was bought by a family whose last name was Wheatley. Thus, she was given the name Phyllis Wheatley. Fortunately for her, the family who owned her discovered that she was clever. Beyond clever, she was wicked smart. And um, they taught her to read and write, which was highly unusual for a slave. And she also learned a lot about theology and literature, including the Bible, while tending to her household duties. By age 12 or 13, she had become Christian and an outstanding poet. Now, how many of you were writing poetry at 12 or 13? Let me see a show of hands. <laughs> or before. Okay. The school count? School projects? Yeah, school projects, all kinds yep. of things. Yep. Lots, and uh, lots and lots of us were trying our hands at poetry <laughs> in that age, weren't we? Oh, yeah. Um, and some of us actually created something that was akin to poetry. Phyllis wrote poems that were published when she was 13 in a newspaper. Um, and that is astounding for a slave of that time. Now, her poetry 
always had something to do with her faith. And I have to tell you, I have a hard time understanding why people from a foreign country who were brought here in slavery found the Bible and Christianity appealing. You know? Why would they find that appealing when that was the faith of their owners, their masters, the people who enslaved them? I've always had a hard time understanding that because we know that many of them came with some kind of spirituality of their own when they came from Africa. I still struggle with that question. After all, if I told you I was going to be the king of you now, oh, the queen of you, whatever, the ruler of you, okay, I am now the ruler of you. You ready? You will believe that the moon rises before the sun and that they move from west to east. Everybody ready? No. Nobody's ready. People are looking away. Bill says, nah. I just, it's hard for me to believe that slaves could understand something that was helpful to them about Christianity. But we know that they did. It turns out that they, s oop, yeah, we're almost there. Um, it turns out that they saw beyond the faith of their masters, and they found hope in the stories of the Hebrews escaping slavery in oh. Egypt. They found hope in the promises of God to be with them, like the one we just read in the Psalms. And most importantly, they found hope in the stories of Jesus, teaching and healing and sharing and treating the least as the most important. They understood Jesus as a savior, as a liberator. So Christian faith became important to many slaves in this country. And we know that because of their stories and their poems and their preaching, and especially from their songs. They declare a hope, a hope for freedom and liberation of spirit and body and mind. And they declare joy of not being a slave owned by a master, but the joy of being beloved children of God. So that's what Phyllis Wheatley introduces us to, even in the time before the revolution. And we're going to hear Phyllis's voice in a little bit during the sermon. But I want to invite you to join me in thanking God for a message. Dear God, we thank you so much for the message of freedom and the inspiration that it brings to all kinds of people. We pray that you would free us in spirit and in mind that we might join the many people who are joined in Christian faith. Amen. Now we're going to join our voices with another wonderful song that reminds us of these ideas. It's called Get On Board, Little Children. Some of you know it, yes? Let's be nodding up and down. Um, it's the one that we sang when we were little children. Um, and again, it's recorded. I have the recording of the Fisk singers who were the most famous African-American singing group of the late 1800s. And so we're going to join them as we sing. Get on board, little children. If you want to just join in the chorus, the single voice that leads the verses goes pretty fast. Stay with him if you want, or just listen. Oh, 
gospel train is coming. I hear it just at hand. I hear the carols moving and rumbling through the land. Get on board, children, get on board, children, get on board, children. For this one for me, I'm more. Get on board, children, get on board, children, get on board, children. For this one for me, I'm more. Now the station, oh sinner, don't be vain, but come and get your ticket and be ready for the train. Get on board, children, get on board, children, get on board, children, for there's room for me on board. Get on board, children, get on board, children, get on board, children, get on board. Children, for there's room for me on board. Cheap and all can go, the rich and poor are there. No second class aboard this train, no difference in the fare. Get on board, children, get on board, children, get on board, children. For there's room for me on board, get on board, children, get on board, children, get on board, children. For there's room for me on board. I'm assuming you passed it on to me, but I didn't hear you. I am. <laughs> Evidently, my mic is sliding back and forth in my pocket. That's okay. I was reading lips. Our second Bible reading today comes from the Gospel of Matthew. It is always an appropriate reading for a communion Sunday. It is also a story that may help us better understand the universal appeal of Jesus and the solace and hope that slaves in our country might have discovered in Christian faith. It tells us of the great compassion and care Jesus felt for the people in the crowds who followed him. He saw and understood their needs and did everything he could to help them. And he taught his followers to do the same. Hear now the reading from Matthew chapter 14, verses 13 through 21 from the inclusive Bible version. When Jesus heard about the death of John, he left Nazareth by boat and went to a deserted place to be alone. The crowds heard of this and followed him from their towns on foot. When Jesus went ashore and saw the vast throng, his heart was moved with compassion and he healed their sick. As evening drew on, the disciples approached Jesus and said, This is a deserted place, and it is already late. Dismiss the crowds so they can go to the villages and buy some food for themselves. Jesus said to them, There is no need for them to go. Give them something to eat yourselves. We have nothing here, they replied, but five loaves and a couple of fish. Bring them here, Jesus said. Then he ordered the crowds to sit on the grass. Taking the five loaves and two fish, Jesus looked up to heaven, blessed the food, broke it, and gave it to the disciples, who in turn gave it to the people. All those present ate their fill. The fragments remaining, when gathered up, filled 12 baskets. About 5,000 families were fed. This ends our reading for today. Thank you, Evelyn. You're welcome. I want to keep this morning's message as simple as I can. And that means I'm going to try to let the poets speak for themselves to some degree or another. But as I start, I want to thank um, Tim and Suzanne, our gurus of tech, for being able to help me with today's sermon because not only are we using the um, technology that beams the service to you, we're also using technology 
that um, that makes all the words come on the on the screen, and now we're switching to a different technology that makes other different words and images come on the screen. So from pro presenter to PowerPoint, they can do it all. Thank God. This morning's sermon is entitled "Unfinished." <coughs> And it's about the story of Phyllis Wheatley. You were right. Go right ahead to Phyllis Wheatley. Phyllis was brought to Boston, as I said, as a slave in approximately 1761. And she was purchased by John Wheatley as a personal servant to his wife. As I also mentioned, she received lessons in theology and English and Latin and Greek with ancient history, his, uh, ancient history, mythology, and literature added to her curriculum as she proved so able. She went on to write poetry. Well, this happened at a time when African Americans were discouraged and limited from learning how to read and write. Phyllis Wheatley's life was an anomaly. She was published after some time, having looked for um, sponsors in the United States, but no one wanted to sponsor the book by a colored woman. And so she found sponsors in England where the financial support did um, come, and her book was published. Guys, her book. I did. Okay. Her book. It was published in England and brought to the United States. It was called Poems on Various Subjects, Religious and Moral. Her book and her work were strongly influenced by her Christianity and by the promise of life after death which was part of what made her poetry stand out. 20 of her poems are elegies, remembrances of persons who have died, written to comfort relatives with the promise of eternal life in heaven. Since religion played a key role in Phyllis's success as a writer, she was able to bridge, build a bridge between herself as a slave and her white audience. After all, very few African Americans heard, or especially read, her poetry in those days. Her work shows life and society in a very pious time of colonial America. At the age of 14, she published this book, and she also published two poems, an address to an atheist and an address to the deist in which she urges both atheists and deists to believe in the God who created the universe and in the God of Jesus Christ. Wheatley was also a strong supporter of America's fight for independence when that time came. She penned several poems in honor of George Washington, the Continental Army's commander. She sent one of those works written in 1775 to Washington and inspired him to invite her for a visit at his headquarters in Cambridge, Massachusetts. She visited Washington there in March of 1776, an auspicious year for sure. Phyllis went on to write many poems, unfortunately, a number of them are lost to us. She wrote perhaps 145, of which we have only a quarter. Sadly, after the death of her owners, the Wheatley family, Phyllis was emancipated, but she married and ended life in poverty. Our scholarship shows that she was more well recognized and understood in England and Europe than she was here in the United States. Early 20th century critics of 
black American literature were not very kind to her because of her supposed lack of concern about slavery. And some people believed that she had not written her own poems. But the truth is she did make statements about the institution of slavery and she made them to the most influential segment of the 18th century society. That would have been the institutional church. She spoke in explicit biblical language designed to move church members to action. And so we have her words and we have her ideas that indeed every person is a child of God and that that principle would save all of God's children, including those of African-American descent in the United States. Her most famous poem, which is a short little poem, is the one I will read to you this morning. There we go. It's called On Being Brought from Africa to America. And the statue that you see is a statue of Phyllis at the um, Boston Women's Memorial on the Com Ave Mall. On being brought from America, Africa to America. Twas mercy brought me from my pagan land, taught my benighted soul to understand that there's a God, that there's a savior too. Once I redemption neither sought nor knew. Some view our sable race with scornful eye, their color is a diabolical dye. But remember, Christians, Negroes black as Cain may be refined and thus join the angelic train. It's a wonderful poem reminding us all that African Americans who lived with the pain of slavery found meaning and new hope in the Bible and in the stories of Christian faith. I wanted to bring you Phyllis Wheatley because she's such an inspiration. And I wanted to bring you a second poet, as is my habit in these things, a contemporary poet who would pair with Phyllis. And my search resulted in the discovery of Amanda Gorman. Gorman is the first youth poet laureate of the United States and the founder of a nonprofit called One Pen, One Page, an organization that works to promote youth literacy and leadership. She is also a self-described candidate for the United States presidency in 2036. I suggest you watch for her. She says that she um, is a descendant of slaves, and her great-great-great-grandmother was a slave named Amanda, who could neither read nor write. And that's who she's named for. In response, she has said, it is not enough for me to write. I have to do write as well. My job is to coax people into my lyricism without them realizing they are listening to a poem. I hope that happens. Gorman has overcome much. She was born a premature twin, and she has an auditory processing disorder and a speech impediment, which makes certain letters difficult to pronounce. The little letter R, she says, is the bane of my existence. So Amanda wrote many works before she became the Youth Poet Laureate, first of Los Angeles and then of the United States. And as part of her work as the Youth Poet Laureate, at the behest of Good Morning America, she was asked to write a poem for the 4th of July in, 19, in 2019. She agonized over what to write and how to express herself. She was concerned 
about how to faithfully balance the love and passion she has for the United States with a recognition of reality, especially the realities of injustice for people of color. In a speech before the American Academy of Arts and Science, she talked about her process, stating that she did not want to be perceived as erasing the humanity and faults of our founding fathers, but wanted to acknowledge them as they were, acknowledge the founding fathers as they were, and point to their example as something that informs our role and our civic duty today. I discovered while listening to the speech that Amanda talked about Phyllis Wheatley and the ways that Wheatley was both an influence and an inspiration. Here is her speech, briefly, cut down so that it's only a little bit of it, delivered on February 7th, 2020, just before the lockdown, at the Academy of America's Arts and Sciences Commission on the Practice of Democratic Citizenship. Yeah, you can read it. Amanda's comments about Phyllis Wheatley and a reading of her poem are included. Just once. But this summer, they actually came with me with quite a big ask, which is to say, to write a poem for the 4th of July or a celebration of our Independence Day. And I was very nervous to say yes, not because I'd be performing in front of half a million people and it would be live, or I'd be performing with this huge orchestra of the Boston Pops behind me with the lead Keith Lockhart. None of those reasons were really the reasons why I was horrified. I was so filled with trepidation because I was worried that if I performed this poem that celebrated the founding fathers, I would then be aware <coughs> of the which inform us of our role and our civic duty to them. And I did a little bit of thinking and I did my homework and my research. I'm a straight A student, so that's what I do. And I tried to think more about my role and what it meant to have a young black female poet writing this poem about our founding fathers. And I remembered Miss Wheatley, who was a slave who actually lived right here in Boston, who became the first published African-American poet. Now, at her time, you have to imagine this young, skinny, scrimpy girl who begins writing these poems and publishing them, and it's like a ripple throughout the intellectual elite of Time, to the point that this teenage girl is called into a tribunal here in Boston and made to sit in front of 18 white men who are then going to judge by her prowess the role of blacks in arts and science. Now, interestingly enough, part of this 18-man panel was actually John Hancock, one of, these, one of the Academy's founders. And so we don't really know what went down in the room where it happened, but we know that after this tribunal, Phyllis Wheatley leaves with this memento basically claiming that she is the true author of her poems, that she does have the intellectual capacity to create art, and that she does have this role in her own poetry and her own authorship. Well. This was not enough for one of the other founding fathers. Never mind that George Washington had also read Phyllis Wheatley's poems and found that they were phenomenal and actually invited her here to Longfellow House, which had been his headquarters. Um, there was another founding father by the name of Thomas Jefferson, who in notes on notes. Virginia, which is considered to be one of the most important published documents of the 18th century in which he writes that not only is it impossible for blacks to participate in things like science, but particularly that they don't have the capacity for art and that it makes no sense that a young black girl could ever write these poems. And so after doing my research and my history, I said, you know what, thank you, Jefferson. I'm going to write this poem. I'm going to do it. And I bring that up not to necessarily harp on the Founding Fathers, but I think that if we are to erase their humanity, then we also erase the huge opportunity that is presented to us all to take up their mantle. And so when I decided to write this poem for CBS, I gave myself a few kind of parameters, which is to say I would recognize the gaps that were left in the work of our 
founding fathers and also the intellectual academy at the time. And I would take that as my own duty and responsibility to pay that forward, to continue the mission, to not look at the American democracy as something that's broken, but to look at it as something that's unfinished. And I think that's something that this convening represents. We all here know that there was work to be done and there was more work to do. And that's not necessarily something I think that's pessimistic. I think it's actually audacious in the hope that it represents. And so with that in mind, I wrote this poem. Imagine that there's the Boston Pops behind me um, and that we're on the Esplanade and there's fireworks. But it's called The Leaver's Hymn for the Republic. Twelve score and three years ago, to be exact, our founders dared to declare the world's most revolutionary act a pact sworn for liberty and equality. Out of many was born one people, a teeming nation made of nations at its very foundation, a dream for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Today we gather so that our founders' words do not go diminished, but also so that the work does not go unfinished. For it's not just a declaration of independence, but the everyday declarations of its descendants that make a people equal. It is our right and our role to remember those words scratched on a scroll so we may live them and heal our nation whole. We roll up our sleeves. We believe in the dream, in these American stories, in the glory of the struggle. For it is our struggle that comes our nation's strength for the lengths we fight for what is right is the fullest measure of our nation's might. And while we cannot shake or cast aside or past, every day we write the future. Together we sign it, together we declare it, we share it. For this truth marches on inside each of us. Americans know one another by our love of liberty. When in fact, we are liberated by our love for one another. We understand that a house divided cannot stand. So let us make a pact to be the country that acts as compassionate as we are courageous. In the Declaration's pages, we write a new order for the ages. Where out of many, we are one, bright as a sun and bold as an eagle, a nation of all people, by all people, for all people, let this 4th of July move forth or cry to redeem the dream. As we remember those words forever ignited that we have so long heard and recited that we are right to stand, but we are revolutionary when we stand united. Just a quick reminder to make sure. Can tell me my mic isn't on. Okay, so friends, both poets, Phyllis Wheatley and Amanda Gorman, are inspiring, and they inspire me to learn more about the faith that we share, about the history of our country, and how we can help make what we believe into reality that we might be more fully a place where all God's beloved children know peace and justice. They invite us to put our belief in God into work and into action. 
as Amanda put it so beautifully, to look at our American democracy it as not something that is broken, but to look at it as something that is unfinished. We are not finished. Our country is not finished. We as people are not finished. Our church is not finished and we are not finished striving for the realm of God in which all God's people know justice and peace. It seems, dear friends, that we have work to do. And so I pray and I ask you to join me in the words of the great late John Lewis. Oh God, we pray that we might get ourselves into good trouble. Be with us as we come together as people of faith. Inspire us, O oh God, to work and live and pray and learn the ways in which you would have us live, the ways that are best for all your people. Help us, O oh God, to grow in understanding of one another and especially of those whose experiences of life are different from our own. Hear and heed our prayers, O oh God, for our world and for our country and for all those who are in need this day. Hear us as we lift the names of our beloveds, dear ones, and those for whom we pray to you in this moment of concern. Arlene. No. For those in the way of Isaias. Brian. Jasmine. Kathy. Bill. Allison. Steve. Bill. Mom and Nancy. The peaceful protesters. Patsy. Hear our prayers, O oh God, for all these, for our church and our search committee working so hard, for the one who is to be the pastor in this church in the future, for your spirit, which moves in all and with all. We offer these prayers in the name of Jesus, our friend and savior. Amen. Amen. So my friends, it is an amazing thing to know that we can come together, to be together at table with the legions of folks who have celebrated and rejoiced in Christian faith throughout the millennia. And this morning, it is my pleasure to invite you into a time of the sacred meal of communion. Christ's invitation for us is simple. It is simply this, sit down where you are wherever you are. You don't need to run off somewhere else, not to a nearby village market or a familiar sanctuary. Communion happens where you are. Sit down there. No one needs to go away to participate in this meal. No one is deserted or too late. Not you who are alone because you are vulnerable to the virus, or you who would feel alone even in a not distancing crowd because something has made your life into a wilderness. Jesus has compassion 
for each and every one of us and every person in the crowd. Jesus touches and heals and feeds everyone, one by one by one. This is a place where you are welcome, just as you are. Here, there is someone to help you sit down. Someone who will help you stand again. Someone to bless communion so that it will be enough. And so it will break into pieces that we all can handle. Dear ones, let us sit where we are with God all around and come together in Christ's name. In the story about the feeding of the multitude, Jesus asked people to bring what they already had. You have done that today in your kitchens and living rooms, wherever you are. I invite you now to rest your hands lightly on whatever you have brought as elements for communion. We ask God's blessing on them to make them enough and also make them abundant for us and for all who are in our prayers this day. God of compassion, you bless and break everything that we are and everything we bring to you. Our scarcity becomes enough to sustain us and then our enough becomes an abundance that we could never imagine by the power of your spirit. We pray that that same spirit, the spirit of life and love, of tenderness and power, might rest upon every bread and every cup, no matter where they are, no matter what their table, that they may feed the inmost needs of every child of God and pour forth a grace that can change the world in the name of the risen Christ. Amen. Friends, we know and remember the stories that Jesus was at table with his disciples. And in the midst of that meal, he took bread and asked for God's blessing, lifting it to heaven. And then he broke it and shared it with all who were gathered there, saying, take and eat. This is my body, broken and given in remembrance of you. And they took and ate. And as the meal went further, Jesus also took a cup, again offering it to God and asking for God's blessing, and then sharing it with all who were gathered, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant, the covenant of forgiveness and love. Take and drink of it, all of you, in remembrance of me. The bread on our tables is blessed and broken like a picnic of grace. Sharing love, we will never be hungry. The cup on our tables is blessed and shared like the overflowing of tears and joy. Drinking deeply, we will never thirst. Let us take and rejoice. I invite you now to join me in the prayer of thanksgiving which we don't have on the screen, evidently. So for those of you who have it on the bulletin, um, I'll invite you to read along with me and I'll invite the rest of you to pray in, um, in, without words. 
God of nurture, nurture and freedom, and freedom. freedom. We have have called you us uh, us at our our table, 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 where we and have, we have shared the gifts of hope, hope and joy. And joy. We thank you for the healing and grace in your love, your love and in sharing your freedom with others. Now empower us to go in your name and share your gifts that all the world might be filled with hope and hope, and all may live in freedom and peace. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is a hymn written by a repentant captain of a slave ship as he reflected on his conversion to Christian faith. It is probably one of the most well-recognized and well-loved hymns of all Christianity. Let us join in singing verses one, two, and five of Amazing Grace. Dear friends, may God's blessing, may the reality of God's love, may the peace and hope of God be with you this day, this moment, and every moment, and every day. Amen and amen. Let us ring our bells. Don't call a bell here. I don't. I can hear now. Freedom. And as freedom rings, Andy plays. Let us also greet one another with peace and love. Peace be with you. Cindy and Paul and Diane.